Good afternoon, everybody. Uneducated Economist here. So I wanted to give the guys from Wall Street Silver a shout out. They, uh, we had a conversation and they aired the episode last night. Great, great group of guys. And I really encourage everybody to go check out the Wall Street Silver YouTube channel and subscribe. They have got a great compiling of uh, interviews that they have done in the short time that their channel has been out. I really give it to them. They have, they have done a great job with it. So... Go check out Wall Street Silver YouTube channel. I'll leave a link down in the description for it. And, um, oh, I wanted to give a shout out to Monaco 64. Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Monaco 64 has given me a shout out a couple of times on his YouTube channel. So I just wanted to return the favor and leave a link to his YouTube channel down in the description. So go check out Monaco 64. I uh, thought I'd talk a little bit more about silver since we um, did that interview with the Wall Street Silver guys. Now, I tell you, a lot of people look at silver and they think about like what's going to happen in the future and they anticipate like their silver going to the moon. That was something that I was very much on board with. I thought at one time when I was buying silver that I was one day going to be buying a whole bunch of houses with it and doing all kinds like I'd be driving Lambos, right? That has completely faded away from my thoughts. I do not even think about silver in such manners. There was a time I did. Now, I look at silver as my savings. I look at it as something that is set apart from everything else. I don't have to worry about banking systems. I don't have to worry about an app on my phone. I don't have to worry about anything outside of my little personal being. Right? It's mine. It's in my hand. Everything else after that is a third-party guess on whether or not it's actually going to show up. You're either counting on a bank or some sort of fund or the electricity to work or something, right? Even the, like, people will argue that, you know, once the electricity goes out, your cryptocurrencies are gone. Well, so is the whole banking system, right? If the electricity doesn't work to the point that you can't use crypto, then you're not going to have a banking system either. I mean, the whole thing is based off of the whole computer banking system. And uh, trust me, your paper dollars really aren't going to be worth much either if there's no electricity. So the idea that cryptocurrencies are a threat due to the fact that there would be a possibility of no electricity to operate them, so is the whole banking system in general. So I don't even think about it like that. Silver is much different. It doesn't matter if electricity, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, it doesn't matter what country you're in it doesn't matter any of that stuff it's a physical item it's not a promise and so that's the major difference between that and anything else that's out there now people anticipate that silver is going to go up into the future yeah it probably will i mean silver right now is sitting what almost 50 percent of its all-time high not quite it's a little over that but it topped out at 50 50 dollars an ounce back in the early 80s it touched it again in 2011, but it isn't even remotely close. Now, if you can go out there and find anything that is so undervalued as much as silver is, that's a commodity that is desired, that's, you know, a, a, it's not only just desired, it's vital. Like, things would not even operate in the sense that they would if, it, if they do, if it wasn't for silver. This camera, the phone, the internet, space travel everything is dependent on whether or not silver is available so now i hear a lot of people argue about silver or talk about how silver is going to be mined out of depletion here in you know whatever many years okay it could be but if that's the sense that it's gone from mining capabilities then the price of it would just go through the roof. And believe me, there is plenty in people's homes. I was amazed. I even said this on that Wall Street Silver interview that I was amazed when the prices really started to move upward. How many people came to me and were like, man, how do I unload my silver? And I was like, I didn't even know you had silver. And they're like, yeah, you know, I got some from, you know, when my dad passed away or I bought some a long time ago when it was, you know, 
whatever. They just had some and I didn't even know it. And so I think about like how much silver actually exists in the homes across America. And it's a lot. And if the prices go up, they don't need to mine it out of the ground. They'll just mine it out of people's homes because the more the price goes up, the more availability it becomes from people's homes. So I don't think there's any going to be any shortage of silver, maybe from the mining sector, but certainly not to the industrial use. As most industrial use of it is such a minute amount of silver that in order to produce this $1,000 cell phone, the amount of silver that goes into it is so small that they will pay $1,000 an ounce for it because the amount of silver that they need is just not that much. So it's incredible to think about like the demand for silver, where it can come from, what the prices can do. Yeah, your imagination can really run wild on some of that stuff. But I don't anticipate any of that. I anticipate that if silver comes into such a desperate need that they're paying $1,000 an ounce for it, then they'll find another way around it. Necessity is the mother of invention. But in the meantime, it's not going anywhere. The demand, I mean. It's still there, it's still prevalent, and it's still happening. So I look at silver in a much different fashion. I don't look at it as if it's going to go to the moon because of this huge solar demand or medical demand or whatever. I don't, I don't look at it like that. What I look at is whether or not the silver quarter that I have from 1964 is going to buy a gallon of gas. That's what I think about. Because I'm looking for my savings. I'm not looking to make a bunch of money. If I was looking to make a bunch of money, I would be investing in other things. I'm looking to have my purchasing power secured. I want to preserve that. And now if you think about that 1964 silver quarter and you think about grandpa talking about buying a gallon of gas for a quarter, that silver quarter today would still come pretty close to buying a gallon of gas. And if they take that thing pretty much throughout history, it has always been able to buy a gallon of gas. So if I'm worried about buying a gallon of gas into the future, whether it's inflation or deflation, I better have a silver quarter because that's the only thing I know of that's going to guarantee me that gallon of gas or food or clothing or housing or anything else. So does it work every time throughout history? No, there's fluctuation. It moves up and down. But for the most part, it will always be there for you. Now, I look at cryptocurrencies and I like cryptocurrencies as well. I buy $50 worth of Bitcoin every single week. I do not ever spend it, ever. Now, I think about some of the experiences that I've had with cryptocurrencies because I've had, I've had it stolen from me, right? I've purchased it and watched it go down by a lot. I've seen the volatility. I've experienced it. I understand that it happens. The longer you're in the game, the easier it is to deal with that volatility and to watch it move up and down by 20% inside of, you know, what seems like hours. You know, it's hard to handle that if you have a lot of money put into it in one shot. $50 a week, you don't notice, right? You don't notice... I mean, you do. I mean, $50 is, you know, it's a lot of money, but it's not like it's the end of the world kind of money. I mean, it's just like it's $50, you think about it for the day, and then it's gone. You don't worry about it anymore. Putting in $5,000 and you watch 20% of it fall out in a single day, your gut wrenches from that. So I buy very small, very small increments of cryptocurrencies. Now, when I see the alternative coins, like the altcoins drop by 20%, I buy them. I buy $50 worth. I bought $50 worth of Ethereum Classic, I don't know, a few months ago. It just hit $1,200. I bought $50 worth of Maker, whatever the heck that is. That's up like to four or $500 now. Small $50 purchases in these altcoins, you don't notice it. You don't, you don't stress it too much. It only happens every once in a while, but the benefits are, are huge. So why wouldn't you play that game? I mean, yeah, you can put $5,000 into the stock market and you can wait a few years and you can pretty sure that you're going to get a return off of it, but it's so small and so slow and like 
unfulfilling. That why would you want to play just in that game? Like I have stocks, right? And you can, I mean, it's not like I'm buying hundreds of thousands of dollars or I am not going to even have hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it's not even like I'm putting hundreds of dollars worth of money into cryptos. I just buy small amounts. Now, I think about like people arguing to the idea that they'll just outlaw these things. They'll outlaw, if it ever goes to the moon, they'll just outlaw it. And I'm thinking if they outlaw Bitcoin, if they outlaw gold, if they outlaw these things, like ban them in the sense that they did before, like confiscated gold, I don't think people quite understand the idea behind that. Because if the government is coming in to ban gold, like to give me all your gold, like we did back in the 30s, what they are saying is, is that we are reinstating the gold standard. Because that's the reason why they confiscated the gold is because they needed it in order to back the dollar during the gold standard. If they confiscate it again, it's because they're going to back the currency with either Bitcoin or gold or both. So they can't confiscate that stuff unless they intend on using it as the backing for the currency. Not in the same sense that people are arguing anyway. I mean, sure, they can go ahead and confiscate whatever they want, but if they're going to confiscate it like they did back in the 30s, that's what's happening. They're trying to back the currency with it again. I don't see that happening. I don't imagine that happening. You know, the idea that they're going to ban people from banking with it or using it as stores or anything like that. Why in the world would Cash App, PayPal, Venmo all be participating in the cryptocurrency game if they didn't have foresight that this was going to be part of the commerce? It's obviously it's going to be coming. Now, you can fight it all you want. Yes, it's going to track and tax and, you know, trace. Yeah, it's going to be all that, control, you know, that controlling stuff. Yes, it's going to happen. I, I don't doubt that. But they already kind of do that anyway. What are you worried about? I mean, if you're worried about being anonymous, then you should be using cash for every single purchase that you do. Not using a bank, not using a cell phone. I mean, who wants to live that sort of life? I am not interested in it. If you really want to live a free life, like, I mean, you really want to enjoy your constitutional freedoms, then learn the Ten Amendments. The first Ten Amendments to the United States Constitution, if you can memorize those things by heart and live that life, then you are free. And then when somebody comes up and starts to interfere with your freedom, you can say, no, I am sorry, you are incorrect. But my constitutional rights say much different than that. And I'm not playing that game. And if they try to push you, then you can say, that's fine. Do something about it. Show me the warrant. Take me to court. Prove me wrong. So when it comes to freedoms, it's about you. It's not about money being traced or tracked or anything like that. It's not about your phone. It's about you and understanding what your freedoms are and protecting your rights at the time that they're being infringed. That's up to you. That's not up to somebody else to protect you. So don't worry about whether or not they're tracking you or tracing you. I mean, if you're doing something wrong, then good. I hope they are tracking and tracing you. Don't be doing anything wrong. But m know your rights. Memorize those first 10 amendments to the Constitution and then you won't have to worry about somebody taking your freedoms from you anymore. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.